So, are we sinking right here in the slip? Sure looks like it. Odd, because fiberglass hulls don't leak and there should never be much water in the bilge, much less overflowing. That's what the automatic bilge pump is for. When it works. Man, that's pathetic. Let me just trace these wires. Oh, I guess that's what's going on. Yeah, and you wonder who made that connection five years ago, and it was me. What it needs is a new waterproof butt connector, that's all. So the final test is will go on when the water level rises and let me put a wet rag on here. So there's supposed to be an eight second delay before it starts its automatic. <laughs> turns itself off. Man. The likely culprit is the dripless shaft seal, so for access, remove the exhaust hose and the water lift muffler. The dripless shaft seal is a plate that rotates on the drive shaft pressured by a bellows so it won't leak. See, with this water feed, if I'm down here and I kick this with my foot, but I don't see how uh, it wouldn't return to its normal position, I'm just not sure if that's inadequate bellows pressure. I guess I could move it. Oh, look at that. Look at that, it's still leaking after I let go. My goodness, that ain't right. Yeah, it's trickling out from the face of the... Well, that'll take some investigating. In the meantime, there's our little automatic steering gear. One of my favorite devices on the boat is the uh, Raymarine wheel pilot. This is an EV100, a fairly late model which frees you from the tyranny of the helm and provides manumission uh, from all sorts of enslavement because uh, if you have to steer, you can't do anything else. And lately, the wheel pilot has been slipping a little bit. I think there are two issues going on here, one of which is the fact that the clutch probably needs to be tightened up a little bit. Let's try about four or five clicks to the right to tighten it up. <laughs> that infernal screeching. Uh, the solution to that, this is a, a, a water irrigation hole so that salt and uh, other elements from the atmosphere, dirt and such, can be sluiced away. And um, for that reason, I installed this bag here in a, a simple bottle with a hole in the top. And when I'm sailing, I squirt it every couple of hours, which uh, stops the squeaking. Actually, I don't understand this. I've just tightened this belt tension control up uh, a lot more, and we're still not getting any resistance. So I don't think that that's right. Better take a closer look. We just pulled the wheel off. This particular unit has 10,000 miles of ocean sailing on it, and it performed flawlessly. Of course, it's only used when there's hardly any wind or for motoring. Well, now, 
I think we have to have an explanation of why the wheel pilot has been working. This is the original belt, not for a new one. This is probably a case of simple old age, but I do remember that last week I neglected to turn off the wheel pilot and we made a lot of harsh maneuvers and, and I think it may have overtaxed uh, the belt by turning the wheel with the clutch engaged, which is a human error. The other components in this are, are really pretty simple. This, this uh, wheel should rotate easily. This is what gets lubricated by the water that we pour in, along with this. The cogs on this engage with the slots on the belt. And this is the uh, clutch mechanism which just when the lever is engaged presses the belt against the cog and when the le when the clutch lever is disengaged uh, this eccentric cam allows the the uh, belt to relax that's all there is to it the um, replacement belt is just 20 bucks from the internet obviously this has to come off and we just thread it through there about do it but it doesn't about do it for the leak I heard from the uh, dripless shaft seal folks at PYI who uh, looked at the video as discussed I don't think this to be a compression issue it looks like the blue hose connected to the PSS shaft seal is putting pressure on the carbon stator and causing it to uh, push away from the stainless steel rotor Recommendation, either reroute the blue hose or remove it completely and plug the shaft seal vent. You have a sailboat, it's not required to run water or vent to the PSS shaft seal. You can replace the stainless steel hose barb with a plug and uh, this is the solution. Um, it just, you just modify the uh, vented stator um, and remove the hose which the boatyard put in there because they felt it was very important even though I said you know I, I don't need a vent hose right well on with it then okay that valve is closed now we can take this hose off we'll get a little water I hope but not a flood Pretty ridiculous, isn't it? I'll tell you one thing. I don't mind hanging upside down like a monkey to do boat mechanics, but I would appreciate it if I didn't have one of murderous summer cold, which for seven days has made my nose run just about that rate. Well, that's unusual. Come on. Let's give this another shot because maybe I was hallucinating. Those mushrooms did taste kind of funny last night. So the lever is in the closed position. That's the bilge pump going off. When we remove the blue hose, water will spread out of the dripless, but not out of the hose because the through hose turned off. You gotta be kidding me. How can that happen? All right, then we'll turn the, we'll turn the, Ball valve. Okay, now it's on and now it's off. 
goes 90 degrees. Look at the water pouring out. Good grief. Okay. So, let's see if we can keep from sinking here by replacing this hose. And now, the only thing that's keeping us afloat is the bilge pump and this one hose clamp all together. Bizarre. Well, as we ponder that, let's turn to a simpler issue, galvanic corrosion. My boat didn't have a galvanic isolator, so it seems a good idea to install one. There are lots of boats in almost every marina, and all of them are connected to shore power through a connection like this. which brings power from the shore to the boat. The problem to be solved, and I'm reading now, whenever a boat is connected to shore power, the hull and drive system are connected to the shore grounding system and to other adjacent vessels also connected to shore power via the grounding conductor in the shore power cable. This connection, while required for safety, creates a galvanic corrosion cell involving the dissimilar metals between the boats and between a boat and the shore grounding system, which is a fancy way of saying, I guess, that the other boats will eat your zincs, the sacrificial anodes we use to prevent the metal we want to keep from corroding away through galvanic action. It's just a box like this with some diodes in it, which after a minimum of thought, I have concluded could could be installed here and then connected to the main ground. It would be easier to install it right next to the shore power inlet, but on this boat there's no room back there because there's a big tube for the uh, propane tank storage just behind the outlet. Good connection on the on the ground to the negative bus. Looks all right. I'll make sure that we aren't too confused here. One wire from the shore power, and another wire from the negative bus. And with this uh, model, it doesn't matter uh, which wire goes where on the uh, galvanic isolator. Yeah, the instructions say torque to 8.8 .8 pounds. Well, I don't have a torque wrench. And really, for a boat with very little optional electrical equipment beside the basics, it seems ridiculous to me that I have to have all of these tools. But the truth is that if you're going to do any electrical work on your boat over the years, uh, uh, a full selection of almost everything is required. You know, just to get just to get these little simple jobs done at all. I'm no electrical whiz, believe me. And usually when it comes to AC on the boat, as opposed to DC circuits, I leave that to a professional electrician, but it seems to me that installing a galvanic isolator is so simple anybody can do it. So this is the heat exchanger and uh, down at the bottom is the sacrificial anode because the seawater runs through here and of course it's salt water for me and uh, we don't want the delicate innards to corrode so we 
put in an anode that will corrode in its place. Well, there we go. A sacrificial anode that has done its job and time to be replaced. And I don't, if they come out whole like that, it means there's probably not any debris uh, left up in there to clog things. Man, sometimes, sometimes it feels like I am a sacrificial anode after crawling down there. Some boat issues are prompted not by necessity, but by obsessive compulsive perfection disorder. In this case, by the third, or is it maybe the fourth revision of my poor blameless sail cover. I think if you have a sewing machine, you're destined to use it. You keep thinking up reasons. No piece of cloth is safe. Well, let's see how this works, if it works at all. Still have to put on some snaps, but I think we have reduced the total number of snaps by six. A stunning achievement, if true. As my cello teacher used to say, close enough for jazz. The problem we're solving is this. The cell cover admitted the lazy jacks here and here, here and here, which made them work really well, except when it rains, water comes down the lazy jacks right onto the sail. I tried taking the lazy jacks down and uh, putting the sail cover on without any of the slots being used. And that didn't work because then the sail fell off the boom. <laughs> it turns out that I really do like to have lazy jacks since I often do most of the rigging and unringing myself. So maybe this revision, which is just to extend the former uh, covers down another few inches and put some leather on here to absorb the chafe will give me the ability to to keep the lazy jacks on all the time which is really what i prefer of course the whole idea of a cell cover is far far out of date everybody's gone to these installations that are primarily on the boom which have built-in lazy jacks and work really well apparently or in mast furling, which really simplifies things if you don't mind losing your battens. However, to make use of such a stack pack, you have to be able to ignore all of that sail cover hanging in the wind the entire time that you're sailing. Looks good, works fine, not for me. The solution to the leaking dripless shaft seal was a haul out by the boatyard that installed it two years before. Just remove the through hull and the hose. Up and at them, lads. Once more into the bilge, dear friends. So that's where the through hull and the valve used to be. It's been glassed over by the boatyard. The dripless shaft seal vent has been plugged with that bolt. And the bellows has been compressed another quarter of an inch so that now When you go to burp it, it takes a good deal of force to get any water to come out. So why was the shaft seal installed the way it was in the first place? Here's what I was told. There are two or maybe three options for a dripless. One is through hull irrigation. Another is an air vent hose to be led above the waterline even when the yacht's at maximum heel. But 
The shaft seal can also just be burped by hand every time the boat's launched, if you can remember. Easy for Thelonious. Unlike a speedboat, we're only hauled out every three years or so, so just burp it. Ah, but reality intervenes. If an air vent hose is chosen, if it happens to fall below the waterline, the boat can sink. That's happened half a dozen times, I'm told. So, boatyard started installing water vent lines. They are safer in the long run. Even though neither is strictly necessary for sailboats, if you can remember to burp them. Does that explain it? Maybe, but in my case, the real issue was a two-year-old ball valve that broke. Was it corroded? Faulty when installed? A seacock that can't be turned off, well, that's not good. That's really, really not good. Because to sink a ship, you open the seacocks. Well, all's well that ends well. Never look back, that's just where we've been. The horizon's where we're going.